E ako aku hoa o na hapori nei te na koto no mai haere mai ki te nei hui. Uh, ki te uh, whakama i te hapori kia whaka piki te mauri me te ora o te taio. Mā koutou e nei kaupapa i tūtuhi. Ki te pōti mōku he tumu whakārai, ka motuhaki e nei momo hui whaimana. Mā taurauru, mā tōkurauru, ka ora ai tātou. Uh, tēnā koutou ka toa. The small mihi that I um, did this morning really just recognises, uh, welcomes all our guests from everywhere and recognises that this is the committee that takes care of people, uh, their spirit and the environment, and that uh, we make decisions here today around those things, and only by working together will we all thrive. That's the general tenure of that mihi to you this morning. So thank you very much. Are there any apologies? Oh, yes, there are. Sorry. Uh, uh, Thompson. And sorry? Okay. And anybody else? Clock, I've just got a short meeting to go to. Okay, thank you. So we have two apologies for absence and one for uh, ducking out. That's my new term for that. All in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Any, uh, the, con the agenda is confirmed as it is. Uh, we had a few requests to move things around, but in the interest of keeping our public uh, not hanging around too long, we'll keep it in the order that it is. Um, are there any declarations of interest, please, councillors? I'm a trustee of the Beyond Tomorrow Trust, which is presenting this morning. So my intention is to be available through the questions, but I'll leave during debate. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll flesh that out a bit more when we get to that item. Thank you. Any other conflicts of interest to be noted? No, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Move, I'll move that. All in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. So now we'll, uh, we have no people in the public forum that I'm aware of. Nobody up there want to speak in the public forum? Car pie. <coughs> All right, so we'll now go on to item five, which is the confirmation of the community services and environment minutes, which of course we'll take as read and only deal with any matters that are unresolved or incorrect. Is there anything there? Nope. So Councillor Casson moves it. So have, it have I got a seconder? Councillor Bunting, all in favour? Opposed? Carried. Okay, that brings us on to my chair's report, which I also will take as read. It's really uh, a way of me informing you of some of the things that I've been doing um, in the role as chair of community services in the month. Um, so I won't read anything or talk to anything. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Councillor McPherson. Thanks. In the funding area. Um, one is the um, predominance or the coming predominance of um, groups relating, uh, that work in the health support area. You think, and now that I'm now much freer to talk about that, and I think that uh, the, the DHB definitely and the government generally should be looking at um, why those sorts of groups are having to come to councils all over the place for basically tin pot little grants to for a hand and mouth existence. I don't think that's good enough that it's being pushed back on the community by the health sector, so I support your comments there. The other comment in relation to the sport needs and the reduction, though it's not a very fast reduction of pokey money, in the future that is obviously something that should be looked out for. Um, in terms of what would replace that, I'd just like to point out that in 90, about year 2000, the then Minister of um, Sport and Recreation, which is who is now the Speaker of Parliament, Trevor Mallard, actually was the one that put up the bill to remove small grants to sport organisations that councils used to distribute, the Hillary Commission funds, um, and, and he made a speech in Parliament that pokies could now take over that and it wasn't necessary for the government to support in that area. So, Maybe yeah. we should approach to go, turn that back to Parliament with okay. some sort of submission at some stage. Okay, so that's your question. Could that be done? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So can we do some, maybe have a look at how we can 
lobby in that area. Yeah, we understood that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Mallett. Thank you. Uh, just uh, following on from what Dave was saying, you say in your last paragraph that um, alternatives to the funding gap will, will increase as gambling proceeds get lo gets less used. Do you have any indication of what the drop in f gambling... Uh, I have some information that I endeavoured to send you by link from Sport NZ, which was a 20-minute... PowerPoint presentation with some data around how, what, how it's affected. Oh, do you see that? Has, has that been sent? The, the link bro was broken oh. and they send it. I haven't logged on this my computer oh, yeah. this morning, but they're sending me the fresh link this morning and I'm sure you, you'll have all that by lunchtime. And okay. that was just a very interesting report as a back, way of background. Um, Presumably that'll be a national, we'll have national figures rather than. Yeah, okay. yep. this is an issue, as I say here, that affects all councils, not just ours. Uh, the needs of fund for funding for sport to get bigger, the opportunities to find the funds become more challenging is really the only point that that's attempting to make there. Question. So the answer is you don't know that, but... No, I'll send you the information. Oh, OK, that has yeah. got the figures, it's, um, or some I... indication of the figures anyway. Yeah, no, I'll yeah. send you that information Thank that you. I have, and if, it's, uh, if it remains unsatisfactory in terms of answering your question, then let me know, and we'll see what we can provide. Thank you. Councillor Bunting. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Just on that, uh, that line of questioning, was there any indication of a proactive approach to moving funding from gambling trusts, mm. etc.? Was there a plan? Not so much a plan. It was more a um, uh, issues a analysis than a plan going forward, but it was noted as an action for Sport NZ to tackle. Yep. To, uh, to maybe develop a paper on how we might progress, like um, Councillor McPherson says, other ways of funding sport going mm. forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton moves. There is a seconder. Councillor um, McPherson, all in favour? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And now we're on to the first uh, report from our p public. And we have um, the item on page 17, the mural project on Anglesey Street, that big grey wall over there, just in case you've missed it, anyone? And um, we invite up to talk Joanna, Paul... Oh, good, there's a group, isn't there? Stephen and David. Yeah. And just, as, um, just to, to reiterate what uh, Ryan said at the beginning, he has been involved in this project in terms of, uh, which is excellent, which is in terms of driving the project and, um, and the energy and the business interest behind it. Um, obviously, that puts him in a conflict here about making a decision on this, but he is there, um, and uh, I know he's spoken to a number of you uh, about the project, and you may want to approach him later. So let's, uh, let's go to the report and uh, take that as read and get some um, presentation from yourself. Hi, um, I'd like to introduce um, Steve Mundy and David Porter from Beyond Tomorrow Trust and also um, Paul from Creative Waikato who are um, really leading this project. So council has been approached um, with the opportunity to, um, for the trust to paint and then maintain the wall. Um, Anglesey Street Wall has been obviously a um, very high profile site. Um, so normally a mural would be would sit under the temporary arts process which is attached um, and that is an entirely operational process but given the large scale of the wall and the high level of public interest that would likely come from it, um, we've decided to come to seek um, I guess um, approval for, for use of that wall. Um, but anyway, I'd like to introduce, um, who's, would speak first, Steve? <coughs> Steve Mundy? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, morning, Chair, the Mayor, and Councillors. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share here this morning. Um, I guess from a trust perspective, um, the trustees whom are myself, uh, David and, and Ryan, uh, our passion is to see the city of Hamilton kind of continue to develop culturally. Um, the mural on the wall is an opportunity to create something that will help celebrate culture and diversity in our city. Um, who are we? Why are we doing this? Um, the entity umbrella for this project is Beyond Tomorrow Trust. It is a charitable trust that was established in 2008 with a number of purposes, including community development. 
the people behind the trust, as I said, myself, um, I'm a chartered accountant. I operate a business uh, here in the CBD. Uh, Dave Porter, who provides 3D architectural modelling services, who's also a businessman based in the CBD, and obviously Ryan Hamilton, one of your own, um, who's also a passionate Hamiltonian. Uh, also joined by Paul Bradley, who's responsible for creative development at Creative Waikato and the founder of the Boone Festival, and, and he's obviously will be guiding us through the um, mural selection and the artist selection process. Um, from a trust perspective, we're not looking to seek any pecuniary gain out of this process. Um, we're all volunteers. Our desire is to see a project come to fruition in our CBD and to facilitate that process. <coughs> We see this as a, as a nice to have for the city. It's not something that's needed. Um, and so therefore, from our perspective, uh, it's got to be cost neutral for the council. Hence, um, our desire to see that fully self-funded. Um, and, and obviously, it'll be a gift from the trust to, to the city. Um, our agendas, we're not precious about the what the mural is. Um, we're agnostic in that respect. We want something that embodies culture and vibrancy for our city. Um, and we as a, as a trust, we're not going to have a final say on what that mural is. We'll be interested in what it is. Um, but there'll be a creative process that will take its course. And I guess that's why we've got Paul Bradley here with us. Um, him and his team will kind of oversee that. We'll be engaged as, as part of that selection process. Um, but very much none of us uh, have a creative bone in our body, perhaps save Dave. Um, so from our perspective, it really is a desire um, to, to have that process run appropriately and professionally, and then we're here to kind of just support, facilitate, and, and see that put in place. Um, the Trust has been collaborating with many stakeholders throughout this process. Um, obviously, Creative Wai Waikato, uh, Tiha o Te Whenua o Kirikiriroa, who represent local iwi. Um, obviously, Wintech, because it's um, connected to their site, and Council through the roading and engineer teams as well. Um, and Joanne assures me that they are supportive of, of our approach to date. Um, so I guess for me, just some of the key points, the, ki the creative process will have final sign-off by the Council General Manager. So by moving this forward today, um, you guys are not putting yourself in a stalemate position. There's still an opportunity to have a sign-off on what that, pit, what that mural is. Um, we've obviously talked significantly with uh, Rosine as well about paint systems and about durability and about how the wall needs to be prepped to ensure that this is going to be something that isn't going to become an eyesore in two or three years' time through um, bad process. Um, we're expecting that it will last 10 years. And the other thing that the Trust is committing to, I guess, is the ongoing maintenance of, of, of the mural as well. So we hope that it will be something that will be something the city can be proud of, um, that will be yeah, something that will bring and attract visitors, um, and you guys might get to have a look at it out the window when you have a cup of coffee. So, um, I guess at this we're very, at the very early stages, but just from an engagement point of view, we've um, costs. We we have earmarked a, a total budget of a hundred thousand that the trust will raise through this process, and that'll be enabled to get the the paint systems on the wall. Obviously, a big part of those costs are to do with um, need for. Uh, one laning road closure where when would we do it um, at this point again in the early stages we're looking to do that over the, the summer Christmas period um, probably early January um, if everything ran according to plan that might be uh, January 2020 alternatively it could be 12 months later but the intention to be um, at a time that's convenient for the city of Hamilton when there's a little bit less traffic around and I guess the the timeline of impact we're expecting um, would be a month, and that might be in two two-week blocks. So happy to, I guess, from the panel's point of view, to, to take any questions that the councillors may have. Thank you very much. That was a very clear presentation. Um, so what I took from it is that costs won't lie with council, and that the Boone Street Art, the trust that runs Boone Street Art Festival, will put it through the rigour of your usual process that you've done with other public murals. Um, so to be clear, it's not. Um Although my background is in establishing Boone and running Boone, um, it's Boone isn't directly involved in this. So it's you, your skills. You, you It'll be yeah. I'll be I'll bring my expertise, but through Creative Waikato, we okay. will um, help guide it through the right process so that we get a good result. So that will be establishing a, a small panel that will assess the um, expressions of interest that come in. And then that will go to a concept stage where we get a few concepts and then select the final artist from that. 
Oh, thank you. That's yes, clear. Yes, that would be a very thorough yep. um, process. It's a creative way, Your your experience, That's your experience right. of the wider trust. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Councillor Mallet. And thanks for your generous uh, offer. Uh, paragraph 23 of our um, agenda says there is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, has cultural significance to Maori. Can you, what is that cultural significance? I can speak to that. Um, the site, it's, I mean, this part of Hamilton has, a, yep. has cultural significance in that it was um, market gardens and also it was a significant food source area for local Māori. And that, I mean, I'm no expert on that, but I, I know that this area particularly, and also the fact that it was highly modified. So, bef but before it was modified, it was an um, important site. But and that's actually referred to. And, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to add to that, that the, the hill itself that Winty now sits on was uh, Ngāti Wairere Pasa. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right, thank you. And they have been spoken to, or is that a step that has to be done yet? Yeah, yeah. so through uh, Mura, yeah, uh, from, yeah, yeah, Thork is the short name, but yeah, Tiha or Te Whenua o Kirikiriroa is the, so he's kind of been facilitating with those iwi groups, as so they've been consulted. About okay, this. have you got a, and maybe I'm a bit ignorant of the process, but have you got a tick off from them, or have they got any um, qualifications, or...? They've got no picture to look at yet, so um, they're supportive of it conceptually. Of the concept yeah. subject to what it actually is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so you touched on the maintenance of it, and often we get given these wonderful art facilities, and uh, and there you go, keep it clean. Like I'm looking at the top of the tongue of the dog at the moment, it's a bit grubby, and I'm thinking that's our job. So did you suggest that you would be carrying on with the maintenance of that? Yes, we did. Yep, so okay. there. The, what the trust would look to do is to, to raise the funds to continue to keep that tidy, and we'd use a, a contracting service to um, to do that work. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, uh, Toti and Mesh uh, are pretty well established in the public art uh, already. Do, do they have an interest in this project at all? Is, can anyone um, answer that? I mean, uh, they do, um, obviously do significant artworks, um, but they do art of quite a different nature. Right. So obviously um, more of a sculptural, contemporary sculpture in terms of mesh and um, bronze pieces, mostly in terms of toti. So yep. they're kind of sitting alongside, I'd say, in the same way that there's really um, no overlap with Boone and those organisations, I'd say that they're in the same sphere but doing quite different work. Right. Okay. They, they did look at it, but they didn't pick it up. Right, yeah. Yeah, hence you guys. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the my final question, the um, the distraction, the driver distraction, can you just elaborate on the discussion you've had uh, with our transport staff about that? And, and will that reflect on the design of the mural, for example? Yeah, um, that would be an ongoing sort of discussion that we would keep. Um, one of those things is, um, for example, not having uh, words on there, because it's OK to sort of see, th a, gl a glimpse is OK. Yeah. A steer isn't, that was what I was told, and, and there's certain, um, when you get into the detail of that, it would be towards the lights, you want it to be a bit more vague or something like that, but no words, because that's something that would make someone look for longer, okay, so, so if you had something that made, a sentence or something that would make someone look, so um, the idea is um, to keep, to, you know, we have signage everywhere, and we have advertising and mm, billboards mm. and things like that, so it's not like you can't have anything. But it's just about how it, strip, is, it? it looks, yeah. So how did that mind map work then? Because that was all words. So that was before my time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I have no... But, um, I mean, there's, uh, there's nothing written down in, um, uh, that I could find when I was sort of generally researching this, but there is common wisdom in that field, and that was is what um, Robin Denton and, and Jason have been talking about with us, and, and they'll be involved as we... As we carry on but I mean there's always visual distraction it's just yeah so there, there, there's no hard science around it but there's there's sort of wisdom okay. yeah thank you thank you Jeff. thank you Councillor O'Leary oh sorry thank you <laughs> I was just thinking about that words when there's words down the NZTA's the very busy road on where we would drive so um yeah that's interesting and they go 80 k's um hey look fantastic project my questions are actually to the just to the staff um so this isn't going to be assessed under our public art process because it's temporary. But is 10 years really temporary? 
Yeah, well, um, if, if something's assessed as a public artwork, permanent public artwork, then it gets uh, put into our system. Yeah. And basically, a permanent public artwork will be looked after forever. Mm. So when it goes into an asset register, it doesn't devalue it, actually. Okay. Th those sort of ways. So if you, you're sort of thinking 50 years or 100 years when you get a permanent artwork, at 10 years, I mean, this is the other thing with this is, 10 years is sort of seems like a long time, but it's quite reversible as well. At the end of the day, in six months' time, you could water blast it off. You know, you would, you'd never do that, but you could if you needed yeah. to. Okay. Whereas removing a big bronze statue is another. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah, okay, good point. Um, and uh, I think I heard somewhere in the um, presentation that there'd be another touch point to us, but are we not signing it off today and then leaving a trust to it? Um, well, that's, I guess the touch point could be just like we did with um, other murals, so for the Boone mural, okay. where we just came in uh, into, you know, we brought it to a briefing or something, just for information, just keep keep okay. everyone into the loop. But, yeah, um, just as long as it's not coming back to politicians to try and design public art. Because. Not at all, no, I think, I mean, last... We've seen how badly that goes in the past. <laughs> okay. If you look at the process, there's a panel of internal staff with yeah. Sheree and other people on it, and yeah. I have the final say in... You take a leaf of faith and trusting in my yeah. judgment around if, if anything's likely to trigger the public interest, I, yeah. I would probably bring it formally mm -hmm. back. It so if it was a life-size effigy of Ryan Hamilton, I'd put in a problem <laughs> with that. Um, so, uh, so I think, joking okay. aside, I think you know yeah. you've got those checks and balances there. And just uh, one last question in terms of, so um, I think it's incredibly generous the trust is going to be uh, maintaining this asset for the city. Um, but we will surely help them with covering the cost of road closures with installation because I, you know, there'll be a lot of safety mechanisms around there. Have we, are we sort of in that step yet? We're, we're not there yet, okay. and that actually hasn't been considered. Um, we have, um, I guess, our role is generally f facilitation, so staff time, and um, that, that's what we usually give. I mean, we support um, public art. It's um, those decisions about um, where, you know, to what extent we support it is usually made, um, you know, at an operational level, but I, I, we, we haven't got there yet. This is the first stage. So there's been um, conversations about this, but it hasn't yep. really been, it hasn't gotten could to I, that detail. Can I just add to that? Um, yeah. Councillor Angela, um, we have talked about traffic management and we'd hope to leverage off council's relationships, but to meet those costs externally. That the trust would meet them externally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I don't. I, I guess if I can lay a question out there as well, though, that if that if um, if that impacts the project at any time, though, that you can bring that back to council for yeah. for some support, because as we all know, traffic management costs can mm. can run out of control a little bit, and I wouldn't like to see that implement. So that is something that the general manager will be able to bring back to us. Yeah. That's appreciated. Oh. Thank yeah, you. thank you. And the other thing is if there's something that Robin's team are doing that needs traffic management, if we can, and it, but it doesn't disturb the artist, then if we can all do that together and save money, then obviously we'd look at those efficiencies. So. Mm. Councillor Pascoe. Thanks, Steve, for your presentation and, and for the generosity of the Trust uh, to do this work. Um, the wall is particularly large. Um, I assume that you will be erecting a painting on only part of it, or on, or is it over the whole wall? Yeah, I'll defer to Paul, but you, you're right, you're right, definitely. <laughs> um, yep, absolutely. So um, and the artist brief will address that. So we'll be looking for concepts that use the whole space really well without saturating the whole thing in paint. Um, partly because I think that's what will give the best creative um, uh, output or, you know, um, outcome. But also we don't want to be closing the road for, you know, three months and um, having to... You know, all of the costs would blow out if, if we we're trying to cover the whole thing, particularly with a lot of detail. So, yeah, we'll be... The brief specifically asks for something that doesn't cover the whole wall. And there's, there's particular things we can le leverage off. So there's a nice uh, view of the wall looking down Caro Street that's framed from the sort of garden place area. Looking down Caro Street, you can see a nice section. So we'd be looking to, for that to be incorporated in it. Um, but a, a good artist can do something that will make it feel like the whole wall is a mural without actually painting the whole thing. 
So, yes. so your your con sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so conceptually, there'll be something in that Cairo central component. Yep. Don't so in your head, don't think yeah, wall to wall, corner to corner, paint. There'll be something central and strong. So from an artistic point of view, you could make the rest of the wall that isn't unpainted look reasonably. You know, I'm sort of visualising here in my unartistic uh, mind that you know it would be just a part of the wall that would have anything on and the rest of it would be that horrible grey that that stretches for about half a kilometre. Um, no, I think I mean, well, the whole wall would have to be cleaned first anyway. Um, but you, um, you know, often I've seen, for example, murals that might have pieces happening along a wall in various places and they're all part of the same picture, but you don't necessarily need to fill in all the gaps. Yeah, OK. Paint. okay. So yep. it feels like one big picture. Yep. And, you know, you could actually leverage off that texture of the grey quite well. Um, it doesn't look pretty at the moment, but it could actually, in the context of a, of a um, you know, skillful artwork, it could actually work really well. Yep. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, I've, I've moved, moved it, but we'll go, continue through questions. Councillor Casson. And thanks, uh, Steve and the team. Brilliant idea. Probably should have been done way earlier. But um, look, any gift to the city that costs zero is, uh, is a good is a good gift to the city. Um, Questions, uh, though. Yep. Thank you. And my um, my question really is for Lance because in '92, when I first came to Hamilton, there was a paint trail down that um, that wall, and that was removed. And then there was the words in the bubbles, and that was removed as well. And someone's tried to replicate the paint trail by tipping paint over the side I see lately. <laughs> but uh, why, were the, why was that rem removed uh, in the first place? Do we know? The paint that was dribbled down it. Yeah, there was a paint trail oh, earlier on and uh, it was actually yeah. quite well done, but uh, that was removed and then the... I don't know. I've only been in Hamilton the last eight years, so oh, okay. I'm a Jaffa. Mm. All right. Mm, I'm not sure either, but um, but we can find out because the That's question fine. is what why were the previous art works yeah, removed? Yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Whether there was, we can do something around no, and find out. Yeah, whether there was, uh, there was no um, was uh, there reference to Mara or anything else, I'm not yeah. sure. So yeah, yeah, I can yeah, okay. actually answer the one about the mind map if you want. Oh, okay. That, that yeah. was designed from the beginning to be a temporary artwork. Yeah. Um, and part of that was that the materials being used, they were never going to last too okay. long. So it was it was always intended in that way. Yeah, that was brilliant, but thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Tooman? Would the uh, artist use um, scaffolding or a um, cherry picker? Uh, it would be uh, uh, a cherry Or a drone. Picker, a, a cherry picker, yeah. yeah. Or, or a scissor lift, but probably a picker because the, the wall is on a yeah. 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 Well, they could do too, yeah. <laughs> no traffic. Any there. other questions, Councillor Tooman? Thanks. No. Councillor Henry. Thank you so much and thank you for the report. Um, just wondering, is there anything similar anywhere in New Zealand, like in that, in that oh, it'll be one size? Of a kind. Pardon? One of a kind. Awesome. I love to hear yeah. that. Thank you. As, <laughs> as far as we know, it'll be the biggest mural in New Zealand. So um, cool. yeah. we actually, when we painted the Sky City wall for Boone, we, we put a challenge up to say who's got a bigger wall and no one came forward. So <laughs> that one's way bigger. So <laughs> okay. nice claim to fame. Awesome. Thank you. OK, councillors. And because I'm so excited about that, I've moved it. Is there a seconder? Mangai to Ua. would like to say, sorry, pip to the post, Councillor Bunting. Uh, well, now into discussion. I'll just briefly talk as the mover of the motion. Oh, it's no amendments, no. Um, I just want to thank you all for um, the work that you've been doing behind the scenes to bring this incredible project to the city. And, you know, this, I have very few Hamiltonians wouldn't agree with you that the vast expanse of grey wall is not at, least, not at all attractive. And what you're going to do is going to add really value to that um, space. Um, excited about what you bring. I know that, um, Paul, your expertise in um, the Boone Street Art Festival and others will come together to create something, like you say, one of a kind in the country. And I look forward to the day we can go, look at this, everyone in, and other centres are quite envious of what we've achieved. So I, th I think it's altogether fantastic. And the bonus is, as, as um, Councillor O'Leary and others have said, if you're bearing the cost uh, of maintenance and looking after it so that we get 10 years' worth of a fantastic artwork, that's even better. Uh, support the comments also that should... Um, you need some resources around the traffic management or anything that would be considered core business of how, uh, the City Council to help with, then you should come to us and we should work in partnership over that. But um, well done, everyone. 
and um, I, uh, to our colleague, Councillor Hamilton. I know he's been also beavering away, trying to do things in the correct way, and uh, he steps aside because of this, even though he's passionate about it and it's hard to step aside from something. He's done the right thing to declare his conflict of interest, but I think I, as his colleague, can recognise the passion and hard work that he's brought. So thank you again to the team. Councillor Bunting. This one, um, obviously it's cost neutral and um, you know, as I alluded before about the maintenance, I think that's a, that's a really exciting step. I wish you luck with that one. Um, and that, that grey wall, you know, is actually a very significant wall as well, and it, that is a uh, that part of the city is a testament to the brave planners of years and years and years ago who, who got rid of that hill and opened up the city, and uh, and showed how things are done in Hamilton. So I'm, I'm quite surprised it's taken this long actually for someone to come along and and make something really special of it. So congratulations on that. I'm really excited to uh, to see the design, um, and I hope it annoys a lot of people because that's what good art does. Um, but I also hope it, um, it gives us a, a great and positive talking point. So, you know, let this, let this be a legacy of this era um, that we're actually making the bravery of our, our forefathers and the people who designed the city even better. So it's a, it's a really positive step. So good luck. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. Councillor Taylor? Yeah, um, I'd like to uh, congratulate the Trust for their uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Good on you. It's fantastic. Uh, and I'm excited about the uh, possibility of us, uh, as a city at last, uh, doing something exciting with this, you know, what has to be the biggest eyesore in the city, really. Um, I wonder if a, a challenge is going to be um, just creating something that, that has a strong enough presence on that wall. I know that's been probably the problem in the past with some of those other designs. You know, you've got this terrible, dank, grey wall and, and it's hard to, to, uh, to find something that actually has a presence on it. But um, I think my eyes were opened by the Boone Festival recently, just about what can be done. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm really heartened by it and, and looking forward to, uh, to seeing what comes out of it. So, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Councillor Casson. Thank you, I love um, you know, seeing art going up around the city, so I have no worries about supporting this, um, this initiative. You know, things like Boone Street Art Festival have um, provided the city with a bit of vibrancy. You know, it follows on from the likes of, um, I've been down to Dunedin and Christchurch where they've done exactly the same sort of thing, put up huge murals on buildings down there, and it looks really good. Even um, you know, the central city of uh, Christchurch after the earthquakes where they've uh, painted a few of the buildings up just to give it a bit of point of difference down there, it looks really good. So look, um, no worries about this, it's going to be... Um, cost neutral to the rate payer, which is a very good thing, and uh, the ongoing maintenance is going to be done uh, by the Trust as well, so fully in support. Thank you, Councillor Casson. Councillor O'Leary. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for your presentation. Um, I do disagree with one thing. I think someone said uh, none of you are create, have a creative bone in your body, but I've sat next to Councillor Hamilton and seen his doodles. <laughs> and so I, I'm been quite impressed with his do doodles or his doodling. Look, in the past we've had uh, information on how we can't do things on this site and how difficult it is and the loading and the, uh, the traffic and all of these things on how we can't do it. So I don't want to see that with this site and this project. I think the Trust have been very generous. Uh, and gone above and beyond, particularly with maintenance over a decade. Um, so I will be looking for staff to, and I know staff will work with them on how we can do this. Um, and, and, and I look forward to, was it 2020, I think this was going to happen, next year. Uh, early next year, I look forward to seeing um, a spectacular mural that is the country's largest. So well done. Thank you. I haven't really got anything to add in my right of ply, reply. Oh, sorry, Mayor Andrew, you popped up in the last. Uh, so I just want to congratulate Councillor Ryan Hamilton, who's left the room. Um, I believe this is his idea. I know he's been talking to it for nearly 10 years. I know he tried to get Toti on board. Toti turned it down. I know he tried to get Mesh on board. Mesh said no. Uh, too hard. And Ryan's picked this up and he single-handedly put this committee together, this group together, this external group, and has pushed us through and is bringing us forward and making this happen. And this is, I know this has been a dream of his for a long, long time. And uh, I, I've heard him talking about it before I ever thought about getting into politics. So um, the guy's very humble. He's left the room. Um, but I just uh, 
fair and square see that the recognition for this is um, is uh, Ryan Hamilton. So um, I can see him up there. I can see why they're going to maintain it for the next 10 years. I can see him up there in his little green, grime off um, uh, cherry picker there, water blasting it when we shut the roads down. Um, um, but um, this is just um, a fantastic vision that he's had. And um, I believe it was part of the reason why he was so keen to get into politics to ensure that this would he could see this through. And so just um, full full credit to him and the team he's put together. So thank you. Thank you. I think we all support your comments, Mayor Andrew, in recognising the role of Ryan. Uh, it is a team approach which builds success, and um, so you've got a fantastic team. The last thing I want to say on this is um, let's just go and do that, shall we then? It's fantastic. Thank you very much. We'll go to the vote. The motion is carried unanimously. No surprises there, as they say. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Thank you, councillors. It's always uh, lovely to start uh, a, a, a meeting with um, really positive energy. And leading on from that, we have another project that has been very, very positive indeed, and that's the Hamilton Age Friendly Plan. Um, we've got Nick here, and as everyone will know, Dame Peggy is also here, another person with drive and passion who's going to keep going forward. So thank you. Um, we'll take the report as read, but we'd like to hear from you about... I think you've got a presentation, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Chair, Councillors, Mango Māori. Um, just before I pass over to Peggy to give you an update on how things have been going with the first year of implementation of the Age Friendly Plan, I just wanted to make you all aware um, of the great work that Peggy has been doing uh, out all around the country promoting uh, the Hamilton Age Friendly Plan and Hamilton more generally. Um, we are very, very fortunate to have um, such a great community advocate on this particular project, but also for the city. Um, she has been kind of all over the country, as I'm sure she'll be able to allude to. Um, but yeah, we're very fortunate to have uh, that spokesperson for this project out in the community. Um, I'll hand over to Dame Peggy to, to give you an update on what's been happen uh, happening and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting us here to give the first report uh, on our four-year plan of the Age Friendly Project, which got us the uh, acknowledgement from the World Health Organization as being the first city in New Zealand to have such a plan. Uh, in, in my few minutes, I'd just like to go through the purposes of um, the plan. And in doing so, I'll back it up with the slides that you have in front of you. <clears throat> there are four purposes of Age Friendly. The first one uh, is to make people aware of the ageing society that we have uh, in New Zealand. We have 12% uh, older people over 65. New Zealand average is 15%. Tauranga has 24 uh, so we're lucky insofar as we've got time to plan for it. Here on the first slide, uh, making uh, lots of groups in Hamilton aware of the implications of an ageing society. These are uh, not all of the groups in Hamilton uh, that we are working with. And in doing so, one of the uh, unintended outcomes of our project has been how we have brought many of these people together, not necessarily for the first time, but in a different way. To see the police and civil defence working with Age Concern about the emergency plan is something that would not have occurred without this project. Uh, also, we have, in the second slide, um, uh, use the resources that already exist to extend information about uh, 
uh, what is already available in, in Hamilton. We were uh, pleasantly surprised to find that despite the relative youth of Hamilton, uh, we have a lot of very good facilities uh, in Hamilton for older people. The problem is that a lot of older people and almost older people don't know about it. And so one of the things that we have been doing very successfully is publicising uh, what we've got. Uh, also on notice boards, uh, the um, staff in the libraries have helped hugely to publicise what we've already got, uh, encouraged by uh, people in our steering group and in the, um, in the council itself. <clears throat> the second purpose uh, is to improve or expand the facilities that we have for older people. And here is one, uh, one of the most interesting, perhaps, but perhaps hidden uh, uh, service um, activity that we have in, in Hamilton. Did you know that uh, last year, 26 teams of supposed upcoming athletes uh, enrolled in the Kaumatua Olympics? here, which was held uh, in conjunction with Rotatuna uh, High School. And did you know that they came from all around the Waikato region? And there were six teams from Hamilton. Now, I'm not going to say that the best team won, but they had a lot of fun. OK, and, and uh, to that end, we'll keep it going so that you people can join in sometime uh, either now as volunteers helping run it or perhaps when you're a little bit older. Also, we, we uh, acknowledge International Day of the Older Person, which internationally is held on the 1st of October. And that's a very, very interesting international event, uh, which I think emanated from Japan, where they have um, a very high status given to older people. So the second purpose is the major one that you will see in the report that we have documented with the provision of particular uh, projects. But a third purpose uh, would be uh, the use of universal design. Uh, you will notice uh, in going around the city uh, now that the uh, council management has been tasked with 40 new bus stops, which will look like this in the next year or so. And for those of you who've wondered why they, are, they don't touch both ends, the seat, the answer is the gap is for a wheelchair, pushchair, your walking stick, your uh, scooter, whatever. And it's very clever, really, because even just the person who wants to stand can stand in that gap. And, and as I go around the city, there are many of them, and we probably have uh, as many as any city in New Zealand. That is universal design. It's not only good for older people, it's good for any age group, and that's what we're aiming for in the older person's plan. Uh, the thesis is that what's good for older people is also good for everybody else. So here's an excellent example of the universal design. Now, the sustainability one, uh, you normally would think about the sustainability of that bus stop, for example. But we also need to sustain the people who work with older people and to make sure that they have continuing energy, money, resources, or whatever. We have <clears throat> in Hamilton the Rao Ao Awa Kamatua Charitable Trust, uh, which we have a close relationship with. And uh, this year, we honoured the CEO, Rangi, Rangi Mahora Reedy, uh, with one of Hamilton's Civic um, Awards. And that is a good way of sustaining people who are working in this area. In other words, honouring them, giving them status. Uh, and so there is the mayor and, and Rangkora. You must admit it's an excellent photograph of both of them. <laughs> uh, now, the, the last slide is perhaps an unintended consequence. Uh, I didn't expect to be sitting here this year to say that I have had a lot of my time uh, used uh, or happily used, I'd say, by taking the message that we have uh, done in Hamilton to all or most of these people. Nick has also uh, been talking to some of them. 
And I'd use the moment just to acknowledge the huge help that, that Nick, as member of the council, uh, has done in working with the steering committee and particularly with myself. His, his uh, enthusiasm and youth for an older people's project is, is unbelievable. Excellent. Um, Nick, may you continue? And also Fungi, who is sitting at the back row. Uh, you've been a great help as well. Thank you. Um, when Auckland invites, City Council invites you to come and tell you what Hamilton's doing, you think, aha, here we go. Uh, and that's actually happened. Nine months ago, I was asked by the Auckland City Council to come and tell them, uh, Nick also, come and tell them what we had done or were doing for the age-friendly plan. Um, I have similarly physically been to almost all of the other places. The one at Taupo uh, was a whole day seminar. Uh, the one Wanaka and, and Taupo were very interesting because those two uh, places are very similar. Uh, Wanaka might be a f uh, decade behind Taupo, but um, very similar, and they had not really made that connection. But through Age Friendly, here we went. So um, we have become, as Nick referred to, uh, as, as sort of an unpaid, almost unnoticed by the council, uh, P, a PR brigade, because I have to tell you that the speeches made in presenting to me uh, and during the day um, uh, were extremely well um, versed on what Hamilton was doing, uh, more so than perhaps um, what I hear when I'm in, in, in Hamilton. Uh, so. I would say um, that as an overview of what we have been doing in the, in the year, uh, it took us two years to write the plan. This is the first year of its implementation. We're, we really have done very well. There are 48 projects. Uh, not all of them have started, but they've got four years. Uh, some have finished, uh, but we have been very impressed with the way in which the people who are running these projects have uh, been able to self-monitor them and provide us with the information on, on where they're at. So the detail of the actual project is in the uh, report that you've got, and I won't go through that um, one by one, but I assume that uh, some people may have some questions on those details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Dame Peggy. And uh, thank you again for all the work and advocacy that you're doing in this space. And the answer to your question about the Komatua Games is, yes, I've attended them and um, joined in and had a lot of fun with the um, yeah. games. You can't help but smile if you go to that. And I'm, Mark came briefly to the last one as well. So, um, and actually, I've been to the 50 plus and did a bit of Zumba as well. So those events are high energy, very much a lot of fun to hang around and um, uh, mix with the older community and do their activities. Fantastic. Um, so questions. We have Councillor Mallet. Thank you, Thank you Dame Peggy. Uh, on page... On our agenda, it's page 26, and it's paragraph 2.8, and it's your list of projects. Yeah, I've got it. Yes. Um, just wondering, it's promoting cycling for new refugees and migrants. How did that make its way into the elder people's program? Are you doubting that they get old too? Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering why that isn't just everyone. <coughs> Every, everyone, uh, what do you mean? Oh, well, yes, we could. But um, I was asked the same question when we started. Why did we just limit our, our project to Hamilton? Uh, why wasn't it for the whole of the Waikato? Well, hang on a minute. You know, um, we have to be realistic. And, and, and so we are limiting it just to older people within that wider project. Okay, so, it is, it is, so you're specifically targeting elder folk in yep. that yep. group, is it? Yes, okay. right. yes. I mean, a fair question, but, but we've had to um, rationalise and be realistic about just how much we can do, and on the assumption that uh, what's good for older people is also good for other people, um, maybe those older people uh, then go on to teach somebody else. Who knows? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Just interestingly enough on that, that, um, that uh, some of the migrant in the older age group have no ability to drive, they've never learned to yeah. drive, particularly women, and um, are learning to ride a cycle and get further than their local neighbourhood has been incredibly empowering. Yeah, That's yeah, what it's it about. It's amazing. So, thank you. 
Any other questions, Councillor Mallet? No. Okay, Councillor Hatt. Sorry, Councillor Henry. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Dame Peggy and Nick, for that uh, report. I really loved reading it. Um, look, I, and I'm super impressed with what you've actually already achieved. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you've got all these projects going at the moment. And you, I mean, you, you, you're hooting through them. I mean, <laughs> I see that already. Can you see in the future that there will be, there will be constantly an upgrade or a movement to more projects or different or um, that there will be changing over time and, and you're ready for that change and everything? Uh, we already had an, an unofficial next list. Uh, I, I won't bother you with the list already, but it's ongoing. And in fact, I would ask the councillors to, to give me some other ideas as to where we might go. But this is just continuing, really, forever. Yeah. Uh, and when people here get old themselves, uh, they might be more actively involved as well. Thank you so much. If, if I can just add to that um, very briefly, is that as soon as the plan was, was released to the public, is that we had other groups coming to us and saying that now that we had a plan, they were really interested in being involved. So yeah, we unofficially have other groups who are, are really interested at the point where we may review this of adding more projects into it. So we're hopeful that at the time that we review it, whenever that might be, is that we will be able to add in quite a few other actions just because of having the first plan in mm. the first place. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Great. Councillor Pascoe? Thanks. And thanks, Dame Peggy, for the work that you and your very high-powered team do for the city. Um, obviously, it's showing up in terms of um, other cities and towns also yeah. wanting to come on board. Um, my only question is around um, references 2.4 to 2.6 on page 26, which deals with the bus, um, um, you know, with improving the accessibility to the bus uh, air, bus system around the city. I notice that none of those projects have started at this stage. Is there a reluctance on the part of the regional council to get that underway, or is it where it fits currently in your 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 program? I'll ask Nick to, to do that one. I, I, I think probably the correct one there is it, it's more about the information. We don't we haven't been able to source the information on exactly where those projects are at. Uh, we're confident that they are underway, but we are uh, just lacking a little bit of information from the regional council. So it is an action that I need to follow up on, is getting more information from them, and I'm happy to bring that back to you and give you a bit more of an update. We just didn't get any information from them um, before this report was ready to be printed. I just wonder if you could do that, Nick, sure. because uh, um, as I understand, and it, um, the regional council are very, very active in this yes. space yes. in terms of disability yes. and young people accessing the bus. It seems a pity that um, they might be a little bit slow here to, re to respond to a group that comprises 12% of our population. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Thank I'll you. Fair point. Thank you. That, that was a question I had too. Councillor Maungai to Ua. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dame Peggy and Nick, for your report. You're quite flagging. We're quite keen to have a look at um, that uh, Project 3.3, the Komato Village, yeah. on page 27. But my question is on 5.5, uh, .5, page 30, the Aroha na Mukupuna um, Sorry, project. excuse me. Just a little bit. It would seem that um, with the um, Komato Olympics, with uh, Rotatuna Hai working with Rauawa, where trust was a degree of um, that, that project happening already, so just interested yeah. um, how that project's tracking along. Yes, yeah, so, so that project was um, specifically more about um, Kamatua going into um, primary schools, so, so a younger age group. They were really interested in actually expanding that out, and I think it's just a case of resourcing at the moment. Um, Ra'awa are really stretched in terms of what they're doing, and I think there just hasn't been a chance to get more onto this. They are still doing that project, but they were really keen to ex expand out to more schools. Um, I'm not sure that they have done that as yet, just because of other projects taking a little bit of priority, but as Peggy's alluded to, it's a four year project so we hopefully you know within the next couple of years we'll be able to expand that as they have the ability to do so thank you hmm. interestingly enough on that Ollie the um, it was a dynamic teacher from Rotatuna High School who proposed the idea through their sports um, curriculum um, so it was a two-way street they showed initiative in wanting to do it since it was at the peak but you're right it could go further so it was a bit more like that wasn't it yeah. hmm. okay thank you Councillor Bunting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dame Peggy, for all your work and everything you're doing and the very positive report. Um, I have to cast a bit of a, a 
contrary opinion on. Um, there's quite a few here, Nick, that don't have information uh, that we couldn't mm. get uh, mm. information on, that we haven't completed, we haven't started. Are you well enough resourced to get this information? Because to my mind, this actually isn't satisfactory <laughs> that we, we don't have this stuff at our fingertips. Uh, I, I think we're doing fine. I, I think uh, part of the of any kind of community plan here where you are, um, you are basically enabling the community to come along with you and have their own actions is that um, it, it does take a little bit of resource to, to follow up and make sure that those actions are, are all being done. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going okay, um, and I do also acknowledge that some of those actions were not due to start in the first year anyway, so um, it's not a surprise to me that we don't have information on all of them. Yeah, well, um, uh, sorry to cut you off there, I'm just looking no, at 6.1, okay. 6 for example. Yeah. Um, after the election, that's going to be too late. It's that, you know, we've just sort of tossed that into the irrelevance bin about the voter turning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think we probably, we probably misworded that one. Um, I think yeah. if I was going to rewrite that a year down the track, I think it's more about encouraging older people to, um, to be involved in the process before the election. Um, so that might be kind of meet the candidates' events and, and things like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think there's just a bit of a miswording on that one, which, you know, uh, as we lead up to the election, we'll be doing a little bit more work with them. Um, yeah. And that's really around our kind of like age concern and groups like that about making sure that the people that come to their centre are prepared to vote and, and know how to vote and all that kind of thing, yep. um, and, and that they're engaged and then they know where these meet the candidates events if they want to come along. So I think I probably need to take a little bit of responsibility for the way that one's worded, that it's yep. not really about analysing, but rather it's about encouraging older people to be engaged in the process of, of voting in local government elections. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I guess in general this, this report does worry me a little bit uh, and that there's quite a bit that's not being met here or we have no information on. Um, and if any other reports came through like that, um, we'd be questioning it pretty hard. So uh, the question is, are we putting too much pressure on you by setting too high expectations with this? I, I, I mean, I don't think so. I, I, I largely think those ones that, that are yet to be started are just, it is just that they are yet to be started, really. Okay. It's, yeah, there is a few where we haven't had the information as we've expected, yep. but I think l largely they are just about that they haven't started yet, and I think we probably just need to be a little bit clearer in the report about that fact, that we hadn't expected them to start oh, okay. until maybe year two or three of the plan. Oh, yeah, because it also says, you know, new information, so there yes. might be some base information, but no further information, yeah. as opposed yeah. to no information. Oh, yeah, because mm. the, the one that actually got my attention was the very, very last one, mm. uh, 9.4, about the, uh, the mobility scooter training. Yeah. Um, I'd be keen to find out. I, I can actually give a bit of a verbal update on that because oh, yeah. I have spoken to Life Unlimited since then and they actually have a couple of training sessions. One that's going to be here at Council is my understanding. Um, so that they have actually kind of started to uh, to move along with that. So there is some movement on that one. So right. we will be able to give a bit of an update next time we come back to you on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Nick. Just following on from Mark's um, questions, in terms of this report, uh, does it get circulated to all the other partners each time that we see it, so that they themselves can see where they're... Yes, right. yes, we can do that, and I think there's also that, that we need to update the general public as well so that they're aware of what's been happening, so that it doesn't just feel like a plan that's sat there and done nothing, that we can actually update the public as well. Mm. So yes, there is our, our key groups that we need to advise, but also the, the wider public. So that might help, Councillor Bunting, if this gets circulated to the people whose um, squares are purple yeah. as well. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Councillor... Is that, that it? Councillor Tooman? Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Nick, I noticed here on 2.7, there's been two programmes for uh, um, driver refresher training. Um, what sort of turnout did you get to those? Um, I can't answer that question, but I will follow that up for you and, and get a reply to that. Yeah. And do they use the Safe With Age programme? Um, which is, a, which I, is a, oh, you don't know, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll follow up and get a response for that. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Councillor Dave will agree with me. As far as the regional council are concerned, there's a new fair, uh, what do they call it, Dave? A disability concession. Yeah. Uh, for which is free. And also the new ticketing system, I think, starts about October. Oh, okay. mm. So that'll probably come in at the same time. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we'll have an update on that, Council McPherson, at some stage anyway. The, yeah. How, yeah. Yeah, well, it's just some problems with the timing of the electronic system and Excellent. whether we wait for that or go ahead in advance of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we look forward to that. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Mallett. Thank you. Um, with the uh, 
the greater use now of um, disability scooters and um, Zimmer frames and skateboards on, on footpaths, are we starting to run into problems there in terms of accidents or people being scared well, to go out? Well, this is a steering group for a plan. We're not charged with um, uh, looking at those sorts of issues, so to speak. Uh, but my reasonably well-educated guess uh, would be yes. Um, I think <clears throat> I appeared before this council about four years ago and its transport plan did not include any reference to mobility scooters and I pointed that out. Uh, and I really think we do have to acknowledge that form of transportation, whatever you call it, mm, mm. okay? Uh, it might just be the so-called lime scoot scooters or so. Uh, but we are no longer assuming that people will go on a bus or a car or walk. Uh, and so I would one more time um, say that the transport plan, which could be called a mobility plan, uh, might broaden it out. That's what it's called in the area that we're working. So my short answer to your question is, honestly, I don't know. But from the literature and so on and so forth, this is what we really should be planning for. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you. Just one further question. At the beginning of your presentation, Dame Peggy, you mentioned that there's some new areas that you might explore, yes. or, and that certainly you you putting your hand up and offering your yeah. your credible experience. Yeah. So we really appreciate that. Now we had a quick chat when we passed each other in Garden Place recently uh, around um, mm -hmm. dementia and yes. the increase in dementia in the city, which is a huge problem mm -hmm. as that ageing bubble comes through. Mm -hmm. um, have you got any ideas about? Not, not the particular outcomes, but how the process that we could maybe assist with in, in looking at the problem of um, increased dementia. Unfortunately, uh, Hamilton missed out uh, on an international expert on that topic speaking to us in April. Uh, the reason why we missed out, given I did quite a bit of planning to get that person here, uh, but it, th that question can now be answered in a reasonably well-researched way. Mm. I personally, at this moment, am not familiar with the research. Uh, but I think it's probably a good idea to task somebody to answer that question properly. And at worst, I'll get Nick to put my name down to answer your question properly. Mm. Um, but give me a bit of time to answer it. Right, and that's something that potentially can be done in tandem with the uh, health board and other... Yes, yeah. I, I, I think that's uh, a good question because um, in some other cities, Rotorua, for example, Rotorua has, has the title of a dementia-friendly city. I personally think that being age-friendly covers dementia and various other things, and I would almost be opposed to having it subcategoried. Mm. Uh, but in becoming age-friendly, we also have to be aware of accessibility, dementia, and a few other uh, friendly subcategories that are hanging around. Okay. Dementia is one of them. So, so yeah. let's just, just give our idea. group... We'll, we'll sort it out later who does what, if that's Thank OK you. with you. And we are having a... Um a yep. presentation a little bit later today on mm -hmm. uh, update on disability sector as well. Oh, but, okay. um, but I was really interested in the com in the conversation we have, and yes, I take you up on your offer. So right, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ca Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Just and this one's to Nick, um, and it's a, it's a wider than this yeah. whole question, but it's a, a, it's triggering off what uh, Dame Peggy said about her, my concerns and her concerns about. There's so many, so many vehicles and people using yeah. footpaths now, yeah. um, and it's not just an elderly situation. There's no, kids no. doing it and lots of stuff. But I, I just wonder if, and I've sort of alluded to it in other you know, situations in the chamber. I'm concerned that we don't seem to, and I'm not a rules guy at all. Um, but I'm just concerned we seem to have a um, an absolute everything's going onto the footpath. You know, there's skateboards, there's packsters, yeah. there's mobility scooters, sk kids on live, all sorts of stuff. I, d I don't even know. Are, are bikes allowed on footpaths nowadays? Yeah. yeah. So yes. bikes are not, still not allowed on footpaths, but everything the else is. OK, I, I just think uh, that we need to, that as an organisation, and, and it's triggered from this, but it's not yeah. only no. age, a, a, so an age um, thing. Councillor uh, We need to you. get some sort of response from the staff 
about what is happening around the rest of the world, um, what are we doing, how are we addressing it, are we even, because it's, you know, we're there by the grace of God, no one's been badly hurt as, as far as I'm aware of, but it's, those things are becoming like a main highway. Our footpaths are becoming very, very busy, very you know, filled with all sorts of um, forms so I absolutely of transport. agree with you. I think the next place for this discussion, however, because we need to move on with our agenda today, is through um, growth and infrastructure. You're nodding, Dave. So talking about that holistic response to new modes of transport is something that started, isn't it? And we can go... Can I just point out that nearly all of the issues that Gary raised are actually driven by NZTA and Ministry of Transport rules nationwide that we don't have a lot of say over. Um, we can put submissions in to the cows come home, and in ten, ten years' time, they may actually be a fruit. But uh, yeah, they're okay. Not, but the, yeah, the uh, conduit for that for the discussion get, would be we'll get it on the agenda. Yep. Access Hamilton and, and Griffin. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you raised very good questions there, Councillor Mallet. We're now into um, discussion. I'll move the report. Be oh, Councillor Bunting is second. Um, any discussion? I just want to um, just. Again, once again, thank you for your hard work. Those fabulous events we've had this year have been so hugely attended. Mm. And um, I think the 50 Plus Expo was amazing. So, And the Komatua Games, if you haven't been to them, councillors, <laughs> I um, challenge you to get along because you can play all kinds of really fun activities and see people smiling and laughing, and it just is very uplifting. So um, happy to move it. Seconded by Councillor Bunting. Oh, we do have some discussion. Thank you, Councillor Bunting. I, 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 I was, um, I'm glad to second it because I fully support the work you're doing. Um, I would like to see a little bit more detail on the next report, though, Nick. Thank you. I think we've, we've discussed that um, because it then will be really tangible and useful for us to, uh, to be able to support you a little bit better. OK. Any other comments? There being none. Oh, Councillor... Um, sorry, Mayor Andrew. Chair. Um, Nick, thank you for the work you do here, um, working closely with Dame Peggy. And um, Peggy, we just thank you for picking this up. Um, when I became mayor, I didn't continue with the um, older persons um, yeah, council, right. and uh, you just picked it up. You've run with it with both hands, and you've achieved remarkably. Um, and we just, um, I just praise you for all you've done in, in taking this forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the board to vote. Am I allowed a last word? You may have a last word. It's actually two words. Oh, sorry, Dave. Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry, didn't reset. Just reset. Let's just um, finish the vote and then... Oh, well. Yep. And then yes. No? Yes, yeah, say... Carry on. I, I've, I've, been, I've been given the, the uh, privilege of the last word. Actually, two words. Um, with respect to uh, Councillor Mullet's question, on the footpath being used in multiple ways. Um, uh, can I suggest that the council or whoever does it looks at the case study of calling it mobility rather than transport and tracing the path of a person who wants to go to a concert in the new Waikato Regional Theatre. There is a lot of concern about the accessibility of that building and if we were to think of 10 different ways of getting there uh, at half past seven on a Saturday night, that might give us some idea of where we need to go. OK, thank you. My second thing Oops, would be to, to, to um, say, I would like, please, the council to mention age-friendly plan in your speeches, uh, your writings, um, we have actually been a little bit disappointed in so far as um, people outside Hamilton know more about our age friendly plan than here. And I have yet to see um, a publication coming from the council which actually refers to the fact that we have an age friendly plan. Okay. So um, thank, together thank we can do it. Thank you. You raise a couple of issues, the um, accessibility of the theatre, which we work through in due course, and we take on board your feedback. But <laughs> thank you with the vote. We've done the vote. Yep. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you.
So Go Eco are, are downstairs because it was there. Just the way the timing worked out, they're just giving their um, short presentation to the hearings downstairs. So we're going to, with your leave, um, change the agenda and just um, give them another 20 minutes to appear um, and um, go to the... Ah, here you are. Class for Gambling on hunt page 164. And because we will have... Um, I, I suspect this will go for a little bit of time... Following this item, just so you can tell Go Eco, we will have a short comfort stop break cup of tea. Okay. Yes? For the Go Eco? They're downstairs. They're not here. No, but aren't we waiting for Joe Wrigley to come back? Yes, we are. We're waiting for a key speaker. But, you know, we'll get to you as soon as you're doing, they've done the other work. Thank you. Hi, Jen. Good Thank morning. you for hanging around. No problem at all. Um, with me today is Sandra Murray, who's a policy consultant who's been working on this and our other policies. Um, so the reason you are seeing this today is that it has a September 2019 uh, review date. And today at this meeting, we are seeking your guidance on um, whether to retain the current Class 4 gambling venues policy or ask the community for their view on whether they should or we should retain the current policy or adopt a proposed policy. And we would need to go to consultation on that. So the difference between the proposed policy and our current policy, our current policy allows limited relocations and mergers of venues and the proposed policy does not. Um, so last night there were a couple of questions that came out um, on email that I just, I'll just address as well. There are some papers that have been handed out in relation to that. One is a list of all of the venues and the number of machines that they have. And the other is a graph of the number of machines in Hamilton. Um, and you'll see that it has been going down since March uh, 2015. Um, so the question was um, on, I think it's paragraph 24, it says that, we, that the number of machines increased by 182. Gasp. It didn't. Uh, the, the data says that it um, went up by 18. The 2 was supposed to be a little superscript, 2 in the top. Um, just to source the Department of Internal Affairs is the people we got the information from. And the reason that it looks like it's gone up is because the uh, venue moved across the road. So they, the, so our numbers actually go down by 18 a couple of months before and then back up by the 18 once they opened their doors across the road. So it's a data anomaly. And the graph you have in front of you now uh, will show that information. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I'm happy to just take questions. Yep, I think we can take the rest as read. Thank you for that clear introduction. And you got an email last night just because we were, when we went through the um, preparation, we realised that it was a little bit confusing about the point of difference. But I think you've articulated that really clearly now so that we all understand what option A and option B are. Councillor Paula, just, just one more thing. Um, retaining the policy does require a recommendation to council. Right. So either which way we're recommending to council, either go to pub consultation or to, to retain. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mallett. Thank you. Um, and maybe I'll... Something, because I didn't quite get what you were saying there. Um, my understanding is, and I've got your email from last night, uh, which of the... So, first of all, if we do, don't change, does that still not have to go out to public consultation? You can retain, you can retain the, the current policy by just recommending that change to, with that to council. That doesn't have to go to Okay, and that doesn't require a, a mm. public consultation That's process? Right. Okay. Okay, wh so, and which of these options is to retain? Option one. Okay, option one, which is called option A in our... Ah, uh, um, yes, yep, option yep, A cool. in the original report. Yep. And yep, that, so. okay, and that has... That, that I thought you just said... That is, that is a sinking lid, um, but the, the sinking lid, a, a, a operator can move within the zone and relocate. The other one won't allow any relocation. That's right. Broadly. Okay. That's right. 
So, sorry, I just misunderstood what you said. I thought you, none of, uh, it sounded like you were saying neither of the options provided that. But that's, no, the current no. policy does, yes. Yeah, okay. Which is uh, option one? Yes. Thank you. You're referring to that I haven't seen and oh, where this information came from, which I don't know who asked for it and how it got here. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't see those emails. Um, did so anyone else receive, did everyone receive those emails? Was it last night? Yes. Yeah. It was just really to clarify the position between option A and B because when Well, no Monga Maldi didn't receive it, so Did you not? Well, and Apologies. I didn't receive it, so Apologies I'm just But but in any case it's not not uh, a big problem here. Is that one? No, no, uh, yeah, it would have come from me. It's not such a big problem, however. Um, when Councillor Hamilton and I were, were reviewing the final agenda to come out, we were just a little bit confused what the actual differences between option A and B were, so we asked that some clarification get sent to Council, and that came out by email last night. Having said that, Jen has now clearly articulated the position, and through your questioning, you can... Um, Ask her again if you feel that you haven't quite landed on that certainty. Um, Councillor O'Leary. Um, I responded to you, to you last night about asking for this information, so thank you. Um, so, yeah, the report was confusing, um, but I think from the email and from the graph, there has been no increase in pokey machines in the city. That's, That's correct. Right. It's just that a venue changed. So point in time, machines went down. Point in time, when the venue reopened, machines went back up to what it was. Okay. That's right. So we reviewed, just a question, we reviewed um, the policy last year. It's normal practice, I know, I understand elected members can raise a policy at any time, but it's normal practice that once we've reviewed a policy, we don't then we don't then review the policy for another three years. So you've put in here 2021 and, and B in your recommendation. Are there any, is there any other changes or any other reason why we should be reviewing this policy again 12 months after the last time? Um, so the reason it's been reviewed again this time is that uh, last year there was a thought that the census information would right. provide additional information about deprivation. And so we um, postponed the policy and, and you know, the review and asked that it come back again by September this year. Well, no, we, we didn't postpone, we did, oh, we did do the review, yeah. Yes, um, and, and because we thought we would have census information on deprivation for this report. However, um, as you may be aware, the census information <laughs> yes. is uh, not only delayed, but will not give us the same deprivation information that we anticipated. Um, and we will probably not get that information now until after the next census. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good question. Councillor Henry. Thank you so much. And just following on from that question is really going through that whole um, issue again and um, maybe in through, through the consultation. How much extra is that going to cost us or the ratepayers? Um, so this, there was an expectation that we would be reviewing this this year, so it is budgeted for. Okay. It still costs money. It does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Pascoe. Just following on from those last two uh, questions, is there really a point in us considering this now, given that we were waiting for the census and we now know that we're not going to get any information uh, that is going to lead us to do anything differently than we did 12 months ago. So my understanding is that there was a date on that, and so we needed to bring it back. The expectation was we would have that information. Yep. We don't. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, the was, can I decision just... will be up to council as to whether to take this any further or to, to fall back to the review that we did last year, given nothing has changed. There was, there was one additional piece of information that we obtained this time, which is that we did an, an um, additional analysis on the impact on the community sector of a reduction in venues or a reduction in gaming numbers to assess whether or not, um, if there was a reduction in venues or a reduction in gaming machine numbers, whether that would reduce the pool of funding available to the community sector. Uh, we did that analysis and 
uh, basically concluded that there would be um, an un it would be unlikely in the short to medium term for there to be any impact on community funding due to the fact that the funding pool has been steadily increasing even without an increase in venues or machine numbers. So we just uh, added that information in due to councillor interest in that topic last year. Thank you. So people are spending more money in the mach existing machines. So more people are gambling despite the reduction of Yes, machines. yes. Even though there's been no change in venue numbers or gaming mm. machine numbers, the amount of money being spent on gambling is increasing. Okay, thank you. Councillor um, Okay, Pascoe. yep, thank you. Now, on, in paragraph 24, and I understand the, the error on the second bullet point, um, um, but the first bullet point deals with a gross machine profit, which has gone up by 2.7%. Is that the result of increased gambling, or is it the result of the operators being able to alter the profit that they are able to retain from each machine? There is no change to the amount of profit that uh, gaming machine operators are allowed to claim because that is quite strictly controlled. Mm, okay. um, it's, either, it's, yeah, it's either that individual gamblers are spending more money or that there are more gamblers spending money, one or the other. The, the data did not specify. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. And then further on in that uh, same paragraph, um, we do, um, obviously we've answered the second bullet point, um, but in the, in the last bullet point we talk about, uh, and we're comparing a percentage in the earlier one of 4.3%. That obviously is incorrect too, isn't it? That in fact it went down by 4.4% in the previous month, but went back up again when those 18 machines were relocated. Yes, so there wasn't really an increase in the number of percentage right. increase. So the number of machines went down in the September quarter and then they went back up the same amount in the By the same quarter. amount. Yeah. So really there's been, there's been if, no you, if you look at that snapshot over uh, 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 more months, there's yes. been no increase at all. That's correct. No change in the number of venues, no change in the number of machines other than that brief uh, uh, little... Yeah, and the percentage change in that kind of period is exactly this, is zero. Correct. Yeah, okay. So why would we then compare, in that last uh, bullet point, a percentage of 31% increase, but one that covers 45 months, uh, compared with um, the 12-month increase that we've got in the first bullet point? Are we kind of misleading a little bit with some stats to say um, um, that that 31% increase on its own looks quite significant? but it's over 45 months? Uh, I wasn't intending for that. I was just simply listing some key statistics from the Department of Internal Affairs website. Uh, possibly I could have put that bullet point in a different list. Um, I, I wasn't aware that it would be perceived that way. It was just I was just trying to show there that uh, sometimes if you look at something over a 12-month period, it may appear that something is happening, and when you look at it over a longer period of time, the, the trend may be different. So I was just trying to put that uh, short-term versus long-term comparator in there. Okay, but the percentage obviously is going to be much higher, isn't it, over, over that longer period than it will be over a shorter period? Correct. Uh, the, the reason I thought that, that was applicable was because I was looking at um, the amount of money that the community sector might be able to access over time. And so I was interested mm -hmm. in whether okay. there were fluctuations occurring for that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the, the, on page 169, and it hasn't got a number, but it's that uh, pie graph. Um, is that pie graph um, based, is, is that pie graph is taking into account the 0.2 of 1% of the population who are deemed to be problem gamblers? Yes. Yep, okay, so it is that very, very small group. It's not solely that number. I mean, that number is incorporated in the graph, but that graph is not only that number. So this is all gamblers. All problem gamblers? No, all primary gambling mode for new people presenting to problem gambling. So this is people who are presenting as having a problem, um, and it's where, where their problem gambling occurs. It's not just people who identify specifically as problem gamblers. Um, there's actually a, like a, a hierarchy of problem gambling from from sort of low to high. Yep. And so this, this pie graph represents all of those people who are presenting 
as having a problem gambling, not, not just the high-level problem gamblers, which is the percentage that you're referring to? So if you go down to the next graph where you've split uh, the, uh, the Fig 18 in paragraph 38, where you've got the three levels, you've got low-risk gambling, you've got moderate-risk gambling, and you've got problem gambling, uh, and then you've added them all together to the total gambling problems, what of, which of those groups is, is represented in that pie chart? Or do, do we know which of the groups and which ones yeah, are? The, the pie graph and the chart down below come from two different reports. Um, and so the methodology used for the collection of information is probably different. I wouldn't want to say, um, you know, I wouldn't want to compare the two directly with that um, because they're, they're two different data sets. Is it fair to say then, if considering that, and the fact that we're not going to get any information of the census, that we that we are sadly lacking with evidence to identify how bad the gambling problem is in our community. You know how how wide not not how bad because it is bad even if it affects one person, but how widespread it might be within our community. I think that the data that the Department of Internal Affairs and the Problem Gambling Association and others have collected is fairly robust and it has been collected over a number of years and it depicts fairly consistent trends. <coughs> so I think that we have got um, a fair amount of data suggesting that um, problem gambling is occurring and increasing over time. I don't think there's a problem there. The census information would have given us a more fine-grained detail about deprivation in particular areas across Hamilton. Um, so we don't, we can't specifically say that uh, you know Frankton or or some other suburb is is having more problems than another suburb. Yeah, is yeah. The, the level of detail that we're missing? Okay, thank you. And just one final point. I notice in the in the document that that could go out for consultation if we selected option two. Um, considers option A and option B as being the reverse of what we've got in our motion. Um, so we've kind of got it round the wrong way in, in the end. And I'm just looking potentially at confusion that might arise. I know two different documents, but if we're talking about A or B to members of the community, they, that, that appears to be different to what we're being asked mm. to vote on today. Yes, apologies for that. There was a, um, a late change in, in the way we presented this and we've just made a little bit of an error there. That will be amended before that document goes out so that there is consistency so across documents with the, the terminology that we use to refer to the, the different options. Mm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. That, that's an absolute, absolute must given how confused we've been ourselves here, so isn't it? Um, Councillor Casson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, ladies. Uh, I've just got a uh, question here. The separate document that was handed out with the name of the society name and their site name, is that where the machines are located? Correct. Um, because I've got some questions here. Um, I'm a member of the Subways Rugby Club and it says we've got five machines. We have none. And you've got um, places like the Glenview Hotel and uh, Governor's Tavern. Now, Governor's Tavern has been um, Tainui site for um, quite a while now and Governor's hasn't been there for a number of years and it says that it's um it's got uh, machines there so i'm just uh, questioning the accuracy of this so this, this information document. came from the department of internal affairs website um and so it was sort of as yeah. accurate as we have available mm. oh, so it's not our, it's not our information then it's not our information it's from the department of internal affairs yes mm. Mm. yeah that, that's a very good question, um, Councillor Casson, because um, because we note now that there are a couple of places that are actually closed. Some that you're saying don't actually have the machines, and yeah, some that are in that different exist, use. Yeah. Mm. So this is no longer accurate. What what could we do about? How can we get a more accurate um, indication of where the um, machines actually are? We could contact the Department of um, Internal Affairs machine, and uh, actually ask them to refresh that the information business. based on their permit, um, their, their licensing information. I mean, obviously, the, these venues who do have gaming machines have to provide information to the Department of Internal Affairs. I'm assuming that they've probably got an internal issue and that this spreadsheet has not been updated. Um, but we can... So would it be wise for us to at least um, 
check that ourselves first and indicate to them where, you know, we'll, do, we'll have some ground proofing, won't we? Or you're not, you're not wanting to do it that way. You just want to challenge them to find an update, to provide an update. Yeah, probably the, f the first step, we'll contact them and say, this is out of date, can you provide us with an updated mm. list? And then if they say, oh, well, they I mean, they must know. <laughs> they can't tell us that they don't know this information. Um, so I would assume it's, it's simply been that they just haven't updated their spreadsheet on the website. So, yeah. so I think it's really important that that gets done and gets recirculated to council so they have correct information. Have you got any further questions, No, Council? no, thank you. That, that was it. It's just a... a Mangai yeah. Tua. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks, uh, team, for your report. Hey, we missed the uh, email that was sent out on the Friday the 10th of May and the one that was sent out last night. So just going forward, if you can include us on that, please. So just to clarify, so uh, option A and B in the original report have been changed to option 1 and 2. So that's the change. That's the change. Cool. Thank you very much. Councillor Bunting. Thank you. Um, I just want to drill into a couple of questions here. Some of them, some of your answers didn't quite um, match up with my perception of, uh, particularly between points 25 and 30. We're talking about the GMP. The what does that stand for again? The gross machine profit, is it? Or? Yep. Okay. Um, is that per machine? Yeah. So that is the the amount of money taken in divided by, uh, and so that the amount of money taken in with the um, uh, costs yeah. for, for maintaining the machines and then the remaining money divided by the number of machines, and they do that for each. So it's per, yeah, okay, yeah. so it's per machine. Yeah. Is, right, okay, so, so doesn't it figure then um, that if you have less machines, you're going to have an increase, and that's going to carry on? So why are we alarmed at that figure as if it's, a, as if it's an increase in overall gambling? Well, if you have less machines and the same amount of gamblers, they're going to um, supply and demand, isn't it? Per machine is going to go up, isn't it? Mm. So that goes back Just to testing the whole There's only a certain amount of time, there's only a certain number of hours in a, in a day. Yeah. Um, and so the, it wouldn't be a straight, it wouldn't be straight like that because, um, you know, if you had somebody playing on that machine for 24 hours a day, but you then cut down the number of machines, it could still only be played for 24 hours a day, um, and then there would be, there might be a queue of people waiting to get on that machine. Oh, so, absolutely, yeah. So, absolutely. you know, so this, it wouldn't be a, uh, I wouldn't see that as a straight relation, there'd be a correlation, but not necessarily a straight relationship between the two, because there'd be other factors that come into play in terms of availability of machines as the pool of machines yeah. decreases. But it's, I guess, what I'm trying to, be clear of in my mind here is are we talking about the fact the amount of money that's going into all the machines is increasing or into each machine is increasing and that's quite a different concept if you have less machines the same amount of gamblers you're going to have increased demand on each machine so it's going to go up anyway so is it an issue I don't I'd have to check the methodology for how they are working it out but I believe that what they do is they take the overall amount of money taken in by a venue, yes, and then they subtract the costs of maintaining the machines, and then they divide that by how many machines are in that venue. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, on point um, 28, over the same period, total numbers of venues and gambling machines have decreased nationally, while numbers of venues have been steady in Hamilton. Do, are you, I couldn't find much in here about other councils' policies on this. In your opinion and your research you've done, is ours stricter? Is it more liberal compared to other cities? My understanding is that Hamilton's um, policy is one of the strictest in New Zealand, okay. uh, rather than one of the more liberal ones. Um, but I haven't actually gone through every council's policies to confirm that. And yet our number of venues have held steady. I'm not asking for an opinion on that, okay? Yeah. I'm just trying to... Get this clear in my mind. Um, quite, a, quite a few of the, the decreases have come from Auckland where they had a, initially a fairly liberal policy which they have been tightening up. Been tightening it up, okay. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Munting. Councillor McPherson? Yes, just look, just on that last question, your answer saying we've got one of the strictest policies in the country. I just want to challenge you on that because we don't have a true sinking lid. People are, as the example came up, are allowed to shift machines if their venue shifts. 
but a number of councils do have a true sinking lid policy where there's no shifting allowed. So surely they are the strictest, not, you know, and we're another tier down, if you like, in strictness. I haven't looked at every council's policy to make a definitive uh, call on that, so I'm, I'm happy to take your... But you're aware, are you not, that uh, there are councils with tr true sinking lead policies? Yes, I am aware. Yes. Yeah. So they are stricter than ours at yes. the moment. I suppose it's a it's the range. Hamilton yeah. is sort of up this end towards stricter rather than being down that yeah. end towards the bull. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, look, just a, a word, it's not necessarily a question on the Department of Internal Affairs figures. They're required uh -huh. to update their figures on a monthly basis. Uh, both in numbers of machines, permits, uh, turnover, uh, profit, etc., etc. So um, it's a concern that we should raise strongly with them, is it not? To put it in the form of a question, um, given uh, James's identification of ones that are some years perhaps out of date. It is, and we will. Thank you. Um, in terms of less machines. Has anyone in the council and the higher profit levels that uh, Bunty was talking about, um, sorry, Councillor Ubuntu, um, is it not correct that uh, gaming machine societies who own the machines have been gradually over the years shifting them out of low performing or low profit suburbs, localities, in concentrating them in high-performing, high-return suburbs, both in Hamilton and elsewhere? Uh, I didn't come across any reports that specifically discussed that point. But we could check that out simply by looking at even the um, grossly outdated stats um, census from 2013 with its deprivation index that it was used previously by this council, could we not, okay. and, and see where the machines once were and where they are now. So is that information you're asking, can it be? Well, be yeah, I'm, I'm just saying it's a, it is available, a little bit of extra work on our part. So are you suggesting that that information should be brought to council? For At us? some stage it would okay. be handy to see what's, what's causing the, you know, the graph on page number 24, top of page 167, I believe there's a reason for it, and I believe that's the reason, but it needs to be okay. checked, verified, if you like. Yep. So um, you the last one, uh, have you got any information on the high degree of interest in um, gambling policy for these Class 4 machines uh, in Hamilton as opposed to anywhere else? say, the numbers of submissions we've had over the years, the publicity around this over the years, the high degree of public interest generally in Hamilton and gambling at the casino, et cetera, all of those issues. Have you had any scan of that sort of information? No. As to what, then this goes to whether we should be consulting the public or not on a change. Uh, no, I haven't done a comparative <coughs> assessment of whether uh, Hamilton has had more or less submitters uh, or... or Public, uh, public interest to this compared to other councils. Okay, um, thank, thanks. And, well, could I suggest to staff that maybe in future on this, in terms of whether we should be consulting on changes or not, that quite handy to get at least some sort of scan. It yeah. won't be. So, so you can raise that in the debate because I think yeah. I think the question. I'm just was getting answered. a second bite at it. Thank oh, you. I, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dave. Councillor um, Henry. One more quick question is, really nothing's, just for clarification, nothing's really changed from the last time we did it last year. Nothing really. A little bit more information, but nothing substantial. There's yeah. Information in this report that's clearly different from the last report. Yes. Is yes. that? Just so there is new information here. There is new information. So don't say there's not one, there is. Hmm? Sorry, said I not don't mean to be rude, but there okay. is new information in here to answer the More question. information, OK, okay but nothing really has changed. Not substantial. Uh, it's not substantial information, which you well, response. Those are yeah. your words, not... That was two words. So, yeah, but, um, but you're welcome to raise that in the debate as well. So, Councillor okay. Henry, your further questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, sorry. Just on um, picking up Councillor Bunty's and, and Dave's point on that, that issue of potential sinking lid but price going up, are they able to push the price of or charge more for pokies? 
No. Okay, so it's got to be referred by the Baptist. Okay, um, and point 31, you talked about with the, the concept of the funding gap that's come up today. It is anticipated that government initiatives will provide new opportunities for community group funding. Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, I'm aware that there are two um, initiatives going through central government. One is a review of the Charities Act and the Incorporated Societies Act, um, and also looking at the issue of community funding and uh, sort of a, quite a broad package around that. So it's something that central government are aware of. They are particularly aware of the um, perhaps the challenges with having a gambling act which uh, has a, a perverse outcome of community groups being reliant on the, f the funding generated. So there's a package of work in that central government are looking at there. There's also um, other initiatives, for example, um, Eugenie Sage, the Associate Minister for the Environment, has been looking at introducing a bottle deposit scheme in New Zealand. Uh, internationally, these schemes generate quite a lot of funding for community groups. So it, we're just saying that that government is aware of this issue and they are um, there are initiatives going through. In the long term, these are likely to, to be a fruit, I suppose. Thank you. Councillor O'Leary? Question on what uh, the issue that Councillor Casson raised is it is it that are the venues that possibly don't have poker machines anymore are they still licensed to have them is it is it a license that they hold from the DIA My understanding is is that if you don't have um, if you have a license then you have poker machines okay. I, I, I don't I'm not aware of situations where people hold a license but are not uh, actually having post so, machines, or don't have a venue, or, or don't yet, yeah, or don't actually. Have oh, okay, yeah. okay, all right, yeah, and great, thank you, Councillor Bunting. Last, question. thank you, yeah, and I appreciate your indulgence. Um, regards the uh, the zones, is that something we've explored? Uh, to me, it seems that some that's another level we could pull, but we're not really touching, as to you know, can we restrict the zones rather than restrict the machines? Uh, no, we haven't looked at that. And is that would that be a part of this consultation? Would, would people be able to see that or bring that up or can we include that in there? We were not planning to do analysis around that. We could ease, we very readily put the maps, make the maps available to people. Yeah, I think they are. They're in the report anyway. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, just working on something. Thank, thank you. Thank you, councillors. There were some really, there were all really good <coughs> questions um, trying to delve into the detail. I just want to. Um, check in with you all how you're feeling about this before we go to debate. Um, clearly, there's some, some information that has been requested that is missing from this um, document for a variety of reasons, and this is not a blame game. Clearly, for example, this one is um, wrong, and we would like to get up-to-date data. And a number of you have asked for other forms of information that might have been useful to inform this. Notwithstanding, Mayor Andrew's right, there is existing, there is some new information in here, um, but I think we've also demonstrated there's a few gaps. We can um, go on and vote on the two options for certain, uh, that, or we could decide to delay this to the next council meeting and ask that that information be provided I'm a bit reluctant on the one hand because I think the debate will happen all over again and we, and Councillor O'Leary is quite right, we had a fulsome debate not, not more than a year ago. But, but I'm also aware that we shouldn't necessarily proceed with a decision if you feel that the information that you need to make that decision is not quite where it's at. Can I just have an indication how you feel about that, please? Councillor Pascoe. This is not the the well, way so, sorry, what is done. your precise point of order? Well, you need to move a procedural motion if you're not comfortable with where it's heading. I couldn't. I can do that, but, but I'm checking in with um, council to get a general view and how they feel about the information. In support of that, but I would like to ask staff whether there's going to be um, sufficient, sufficient, if there's going to be enough new evidence to support what we had this time last year when we, when we reviewed it. Is there going to be enough new evidence that really supports going back out to the community for another consultation? You know, you've mentioned there's some new evidence in here. I can't see a lot because I see the same, the same charts that we had last time. Um, 
um, but okay, I can't so see a lot of new evidence. But is there enough new evidence available now? Presumably the, the, um, the census isn't going to be available. Enough new evidence yeah, to we've, really... Yeah, we've got the point, go I think. Yep. So will we get any more that would be helpful enough is the question. So the, so the information is what it is. It's the information that we've got. Um, we, we don't expect to get the census data. Um, the piece of information that I think you want us to confirm for the next meeting is us to go back to the DIA and get a view on this, the accuracy of this and get a full and final current list. Council, uh, Councillor McPherson, question? No, I thought Councillor Leary was next, to, to be Sorry, fair. Sorry, I didn't see that, Councillor Leary. And then I'm after her. And just in respect, do you want to proceed uh, no, with no, the decision? Really so, so, Angela, do you, um, do you, would you like to proceed with the making so, a decision yes, today? Yes, I'm, I'm going to uh, address that. Thank you. Um, supportive of your suggestion, but to test the waters, I will move option A in the report. And I will second it. O option A. Okay. Oh, so, pardon, option, option one. one in the report. So, any, so, yep, come, coming. I am, I am. I'm no, no, I'm not. Believe me. I'm, I'm just being clear about the question. All I want to hear from you is whether you're comfortable to go ahead and, and now we have a motion and make a, de and make a decision, or do we feel uncomfortable to the point that we need that information before we can make the decision? That's the only thing we're asking for feedback on now. That's what? That's the only thing I'm asking for feedback on now. So, I think the Mayor's point of order was correct at the start, but um, the, th the only substantive information that people have asked for extra and that can realistically be delivered in time is a correct list of, of, um, yeah. of the uh, pokey bars that have licences and the numbers of machines, etc., that go with that, and that can be provided as part of the consultation documents. It's not going to affect whether we think we should... Um, go ahead with consultation or not at this point. Okay, well, that's um, so fine. I'm that's saying uh, Carry the, on. the motion is there and I, w I would be involved in an amendment to that um, because uh, I think that's, that's the substantive debate. The information around the edges can okay. happen during the course of the consultation. Thank you. So that's all I want to know is whether there is and it seems to me, and I'll go to the next, question, uh, the next two questions, seems to me that you would like to proceed in making a decision on what's in front of you. But, Gary, you feel the same way? Uh, I'm just concerned that this, this report here, um, which is uh, someone else's information, but it stuns me that our staff couldn't pick these things up immediately. I mean, we, our staff are dealing with these people all the time. I mean, Governor's okay, so Tavern has... Ha, just let me explain. Governor's Tavern hasn't been there for 15 years. How on earth could you not know that? OK, so let's leave that for, and, and all for them, debate, I mean, Councillor Mallet. International Hotel. For debate, please. Uh, um, I'm just interested yeah. in whether we go to the decision. Councillor, Councillor Bunting. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of along Councillor your lines Bunting. of thinking, Madam Chair, um, with regards to, and, and actually supported by, by Gary's point there, is that the, the integrity of the whole report is at question. If, if this is, this, it, it, it is grossly wrong. Um, and it, it casts doubt, unfortunately, on the rest of the report, and I don't want to be in a position where we're mostly wrong. There's oh, about yeah. three things that are that are wrong in there, but that doesn't, doesn't, there none are of couple, them affect the I'm not um, the accepting report. that point of order. Um, I think what Mark is saying here that um, he feels uncomfortable making the decision, but the sense I get from the room, and I'll take one other um, point of view from you, Marai Tua, is that you would like to proceed, and you'll just have to vote accordingly. Uh, yeah. Just to answer your question, I note there is a motion uh, on the table. We'd like to be involved uh, for the debate to happen at a committee level. If it's held at a council level, then we can't contribute to that debate and we've, we'd like to contribute to it. OK, cool. So let's proceed. We have a motion and Councillor McPherson has indicated an amendment. Uh, to option two, as it's now called, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the amendment to the motion on there. To 
to, uh, no, I, I, I think it's exactly the same as what's in the agenda, except instead of option A and B, it's option one and two. Is that correct? That's the only change. Yes, that's so right. Get, that we do need to get the language consistent right yeah, now because yeah. it's just going to be confusion yeah. that goes onwards. So it's one and two. One is um, what Councillor O'Leary has moved and Councillor Henry has seconded, which is the retention of the current existing class four gambling policy with its... Um, ability to have limited movement of the machines. And I'm just trying to understand Councillor McPherson's at the moment. Approves the, um, so you're, so you, you're going for option two is your amendment. Okay. Right, okay, so the mover of the motion, the amendment. Oh, sorry, have you got a second? Okay. So we'll take the mover of the motion and the amendment at the same time. Angela, you go first and then Dave. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I um, uh, am the first to acknowledge Councillor McPherson's drive in uh, reducing harm caused by gambling in the city. He certainly um, made his uh, campaign when he first started on to council as a young man on this issue, so I appreciate his principle standing in this. Um, you know, this issue does come with some very strong feelings from, from members around the table and certainly members around the community. However, I've heard nothing today from staff uh, to say that the policy is flawed and that it's not working. I appreciate that some members want a stronger policy and I accept their views around that. Um, we did review this, I think, quite thoroughly last year. It was a robust process and we heard, I think, for the... Uh, 11th time in, I think it was seven or eight years of reviewing these policies, um, the, same, uh, the same harm out there in the community and from the same community groups that, that want to continually address this issue. And I respect that fully. I think uh, the census information is an issue and it's going to impact our policy making in the future in a negative way. Uh, we all know the, um, the uh, incredibly failed process that the census followed. However, um, I do rely a little bit on new information for policy and new evidence for policy changes. And I think it's the pragmatic approach and a prudent approach at this time to uh, just take a pause, take a beat and review this policy again in 2021 or sooner if we do get some robust information, um, which is possibly unlikely from census. So that's my uh, reasons for putting the motion forward. Councillor McPherson. Yes, uh, first I'd like to thank um, Councillor O'Leary for describing me as a young man when I was 44 when I got onto council. I'd still have been older than Councillor Hamilton. <laughs> at that point, but thank you anyway. It was a nice thought. Um, look, pokey gambling is a major issue in New Zealand, and it is not a decreasing issue. While the numbers of machines may be decreasing, all that is happening is that they're being pulled out of the low value areas, which are usually the higher socio-economic areas, and being left in the high value areas in terms of profit, which is usually the lower socio-economic areas. And previous council information has shown that where pokey machines are, when they're in the suburbs, out of the CBD, is primarily in areas of high social deprivation. Look at the graph on page 170, 41. Yes, there was a dip for a little while in pokey machine gambling, but it's going up steadily now, and it's going up at a faster rate than uh, in the last um, four or five years than any other form of gambling. It is about $900 million profit to the providers each year. Um, casinos, which are almost, uh, earn almost all of their profit also from pokies, is the next highest at about 500 million. Th this is a major problem in our community that's been identified even recently, amazingly, by the Waikato District Council, who are seeing money flowing out of their poorer communities like Huntley and Narawahi, going to Auckland and Wellington and places like that in terms of where the grants are growing. There are some major issues like that. Um, the information 
legislation that we don't have today, which is unfortunate, however, it doesn't change the big picture of what's been happening either in Hamilton or New Zealand. It's a problem around the edges, and it's, it's due to the laxness of the Department of Internal Affairs. But there's nothing new in that information. That list that we have now, that we realise is, is wrong in a couple of places, was also the list we had a year ago, which was also wrong then. It didn't stop us making a decision then. Why should it stop us making a decision now? Um, the pokey trusts squealed like stuck pigs when the Act came in in 2002 and said it's going to reduce money for community uh, services and sports clubs and things like that. Look at that graph in number 41. It isn't reducing it, it's actually mildly increasing it. 9% by my calculation, or 8.6% to be accurate, over the last five years. So I don't think that's an issue. Within this community in Hamilton, there is a high degree of interest in uh, gambling policy, and that's been shown time and time again. If people want to say we should have a more uh, liberal, less strict policy, that's fine, that's their views, but be my guest when we take that out to the community, because I know the community feedback we've had every other time in the past and that we will have again. If you're saying, no, we don't want to consult you when we have this opportunity to allow it, be my guest. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Count, uh, Mayor Andrew Mecking. So, looking at paragraph 29, <coughs> um, it clearly talks, we, we talk about a, a sinking lid policy, but we don't have a sinking lid policy. We've had 16 machines that have been able to move from one side of the road to another side of the road. And these are a commodity that has value. They're a commodity that are traded in, as long as they're inside the area. And that is not a sinking lid policy. If a year ago we'd addressed this and introduced a true sinking lid policy, we would have 16 less machines in our city. Now, this is a harm product. And everybody, it, it's clear it's a harm product. This is not something that is made up. It's, um, it's in the same group as alcohol, and it is a harm product. And then it's doubly, um, doubly worse because it is put in pubs and bars. So you've got that alcohol and the gambling going hand in hand. And um, I would hate to think that some of the support for the poker machines is members who want to support bars and clubs and pubs. And that would be very disappointing. Um, with a true sinking lid policy, then there will be a natural death of poker machines with time. Nobody's going to lose their business immediately on the day. Things that have changed since the last time we looked at this, we've had a bar move 16 or 18 machines from one side of the road to the other. We've got Monga Māori around the table now. And I also um, believe that uh, Hamilton has one of the, one of the strictest, uh, strictest uh, TAB policies. We have, um, we're looking at quite a restrictive prostitution by law. We're looking at Sky City and the 60 machines extra they're putting in and whether that should be allowed to happen or not. We've decided that it shouldn't. We're pushing back on that. And I believe that um, putting through a sinking lid policy that we're patting ourselves on the back and calling it a, a, a sinking lid policy when it clearly isn't a sinking lid policy is just, we're just all kidding ourselves. So um, there is an election coming up and I wouldn't want to get up, I, wouldn't, I would not want to get offside with the Conservative voters of this city. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, just to go eco, who have come back, welcome back. Um, just so that you know, I think this might take us another 10 minutes or so, but we will be having um, a 10, 15 minute break after that because we've been sat. So if you have something you need to do, you'd be quite safe to go away for 20, 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, Councillor Mallet. Thank you. Um, I think we all understand that gambling will always, 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 always exist. 
So the choice we choose today, the choice we're faced with today, is whether or not that gambling that will always, always, always exist will take place in a regulated, mitigated, managed venue, or whether it will be left to the black market, the wild west of the internet. And don't try telling me that the internet is not addictive. The second issue we need to dis discuss is that at least with our current scenario, the funds from that gambling, which will always, always, always exist, will be come back to the benefit of our community rather than the funds of that gambling, which will always, always, always exist, ends up in the hands of some gang in Azerbaijan or God knows where. So um, I think our existing um, scenario is fit for purpose, and I will be supporting that. Thank you, Councillor Mallet. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I, uh, just like Councillor O'Leary, I congratulate Councillor McPherson for being so consistent and persistent on this issue. And I know the feeling because I've been on the, that same with other issues on that trail. So I just want to make a couple of points. And one of them is um, how can we trust the Department of Internal Affairs um, with their stats when they can't get it right how many pokey machines we actually have got there some 15 years out of date and that's that's pretty challenging to me because then they bring up other stats and how can we trust them so some of that information i'm always challenged on the trust issue here and they've personally shown that they they can't get it right um, I'm also wondering whether there's some personal agendas in electioneering going on, um, and uh, and that's point you know. Order, I think uh, uh, assertions like that. What is the point uh, of order? The point sorry? of order is um, that she is casting aspersions on other members. Respect to other members. Yes. Okay, Councillor Henry, go on with your debate, and don't please refer to other members if you can. Thank you. <laughs> um, Another point I just want to make is, I mean, we, yes, I, I do agree that, that um, gambling is, is addictive, it, is, it has got a, an impact on families, but so has offline senses. Shall we close them all down too? I mean, have we got a policy to close them all down? Second chance finance companies who prey on the weak. I mean, there's a whole list we can... We can um, put there as well, and I think um, some of them we might address in the future too. But at the moment, I, I just think it's uh, we have got a sinking lid policy, maybe not um, the one that you know that uh, uh, some um, councils want, but I think um, at the moment the evidence is just not strong enough for me to 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 make a decision to put it out to the public again. And I'm I'm happy to wait for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, our council runs and regulates the poker machines in our city. Where's our list of where these poker machines are? We, oh, we that, know sorry, full that, well. Sorry, that isn't a question of process. That's a, a question. That's a sorry, May Andrew. Just wait. That was well, not a process. It's now, not a question of process. Right it's list. a question of content. It should have been asked during the discussion. So, sorry, I can't take that as a question of process. That isn't one. And that's been confirmed by staff here. So, sorry, but you know, raise that point in your debate. Everybody's debating on it, and our staff sitting on the list and not releasing it. I've, I've made my ruling on that. It's not a point of order. It is not a point of order. Okay. Councillor Bunting, it's your turn for debate, please. Um, Councillor Henry talks about the fact that we've got, we've already got a policy, etc. We were, um, and if, I think if I understood rightly, uh, that we've just talked about it a year ago uh, through her questioning. Yes, we do have one. Um, it's a very important policy, um, and this, this our report does indicate that it ain't working um, in reducing problem gambling. The question is, uh, behoves us, is can we find a better one? I hope I've represented you right there, Siggy. Um, can we find a better one? Now, I am. Um, this is such a serious issue, as uh, Councillor Dave uh, mentioned before, that we should be taking, grasping at every opportunity to find a better policy. Um, what we're trying to debate here is do we go out to consultation on this one? Um, it, it was scheduled anyway to review this right now, um, so that we just did one recently, 
doesn't rub with me because well, there was no resolution in that last series of uh, debates to say this will cover the next one that's scheduled anyway. So this was scheduled anyway. It's a course of work that we should be looking at. Um, in fact, the last one was so uh, beneficial to me, I actually changed my mind two or three times and came up with a different conclusion. So I'm always learning stuff from this community. So I'll be supporting the amendment um, that we do go out to the community. The question we need to ask, though, with the sinking lid, if it's not working, do we go harder with a harder sinking lid or a, a heavier sinking lid, um, or do we do something else? And I hope that information will come out with a consultation, which is why I'm supportive of us doing that. I'm thinking at the moment that we're heading down the wrong road. I think we should be tweaking the zones, like the very effective work that the previous councils did with regards to the um, psychoactive substances bill, which effectively snuffed out snuff shops. Is that a measure we could be taking? Um, and I hope that comes up in consultation. I'm a little bit concerned that we haven't got it overt enough in the uh, what we're presenting out to them. Uh, and while we're on what we're presenting out to them, I'm, I am disappointed with this. I mean, because this does actually, it does muddy the waters a little bit. If our information is coming from DIA, and we're accepting this from DIA, 15-year-old information, then um, how do we even know how many machines we've got? And so I'm, I'm a bit worried about that. But... Um, I'm supportive of it going out. So I'm really interested to, in any discussion on this by the community. Uh, so I don't think stifling their opportunity to have a say in it one more time is useful at all. So that's why I'm supporting the amendment. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, Chair, I tend to agree with um, Councillor Bunty's last comments there. Um, Councillor Siggy mentioned that gambling is addictive and it preys on families. We have an opportunity to turn the dial just one click um, by readdressing this policy. Last year I called this form of money redistribution lipstick on a pig. Um, I think to go even further, it's not even non-stick lipstick. Uh, fears and concerns about funding needs in the community are real. However, this isn't turning off the tap. The tap has already been turned off with our sinking lid. This is more like pulling the plug slowly. It won't happen overnight. It will residually happen over 10, 20 or 30 years. We hear all about economic, social, cultural, envir environmental sustainability. This process relies on the misfortune of others. Let us continue the investigation of a true and gradual sinking lid and see what the community says, says and do something that is truly sustainable. With our existing sinking lid, there has been no net loss. But does this mean we are still continually perpetuating an unhealthy practice? We have heard today that even our government can see the writing on the wall and are looking into alternatives for funding regarding this unsavoury funding mechanism. If you're not supporting this amendment, councillors, you are effectively saying you support poverty perpetuation. I can see the headlines now. These councillors support poverty perpetuation. Thank you. Councillor Pascoe. Thank you, Chair. Look, I acknowledge also that gambling does present harm to some in our community. Um, I think Mayor Andrews' comments about the sinking lid policy not working is not supported by facts because when I look at this chart here and I, I get my ruler out to try and measure the number of machines, I believe that the machines were 455 at December 2015 and are now down to 420 at December 2018. So I believe that the sinking policy, as is in place, is in fact reducing the number of machines uh, in our community. The report today, to me, does not indicate any new evidence that I, would, that I could present with confidence to our community that a full review is now required. Um, there's also a significant cost to going out to the ratepayers for this consultation, and I certainly would favour a, a further review and consultation, but I think we need to have evidence that supports uh, going forward with that. Gambling is a form of entertainment in our community, and 99.8% of the national population do not have serious problems with it. I also add, and I think Councillor Mallet has touched on this, that there are other forms of gambling not presented at all in the pie chart that we've got on page 169. These are largely unregulated and no statistic is available and therefore no information on how, how that affects the problem gamblers in our community. And sadly for some, 
that kind of unregulated uh, gambling is never, never, never going to go away. Councillor um, Dave oh, mentioned about um, the finish. increasing um, amount of uh, gambling um, from gambling machines, but I note on that same pie chart um, on page 169, um, more problem gamblers present themselves from casino table gambling than they do from machine gambling. And I think that's a relevant statistic that also needs to be taken into account. I support further review once we have new evidence that supports a full consultation is required. And therefore, in this instance, I'm going to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Pascoe. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, look, I'm not... Um I'm not convinced that uh, there's a heck of a lot wrong with our policy as it stands at the moment. When I came today, I was of the mind that um, I felt we should probably just stick with the existing policy as it was only a year ago that we reviewed it. I do uh, sense a very strong desire around the table, um, and I do also sense uh, quite a strong desire in the community, particularly I've noticed in recent weeks from, from approaches and phone calls. To, to have another look at it. So I've tried to keep an open mind today. Um, we do have a pretty decent policy in place. Um, we do have a policy that prohibits gaming sites setting up in sensitive areas. Uh, we do have a policy that um, where, where gaming venues and gaming numbers of machines cannot increase. Um, we do have a policy which allows only limited scope for relocations and mergers now. So it would take a lot to convince me that we need to make it harsher. Um, I'm prepared to listen again, because I do sense there is a will for it in the community. But I would just warn that I think um, if we get to a stage where we are preventing clubs who need to merge to survive from merging and keeping their uh, machines, uh, I would really struggle to support that because and if we're getting to a stage where we won't let someone move in a gaming area because their place is burnt down, I would really struggle to support that because to me it's a, it's a natural justice thing. Uh, it feels a bit mean-spirited. It feels like cruel and unusual punishment to me. And I just don't know if that's the Kiwi way in terms of the fairness there. So I would re I'm signalling now... I'm happy to listen, I'm happy to go out to consultation, but I would really struggle to um, support this policy as it stands now. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where I am. I'm, I'll, I'll support consultation, but I'm signalling that I don't actually like the harshness of what we're consulting on. I think uh, Councillor um, Hamilton talks about one click. I think this is about five clicks. So uh, I'll just signal that now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll be speaking uh, in support of the amendment. We missed the review uh, of the policy in May 2018. It's my great to be part of this debate, to approach it, to listen to the debate and approach it with an open mind. And looking at the intent of the policy is that of a, um, a sinking lid. If we look at the research that's been conducted on the harm that gambling has on communities and families, particularly Māori families and communities, you can see that it has a significant um, negative effect. Uh, it affects uh, family cohesion. Uh, it has an impact on cultural identity. It impacts negatively on financial stability. And moving away from reports and paragraphs in the comfort of this room, if we look at what that means on the ground is that we means that we have uh, families who are undergoing um, significant um, deprivation, uh, families as a result of the impact that gambling has on them are unable to provide uh, food and clothing uh, for their children, which means children growing up in stress and poverty. And if we look at the second and third order effects that that has, on those children and their inability to actively and positively participate in their communities, um, such as um, education. The research also shows um, 
that um, pokies in particular have an isolating effect, uh, particularly on communities and families, as they seek to escape that stress, uh, thereby exacerbating uh, the issue that is already there. So I think that the intent of the policy uh, is to have a sinking lid. That's why we support um, option two. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, is, it is a harm product. I agree with that. And I'm concerned that and, uh, the overall picture of gambling in our communities is not being sufficiently dealt with at a national level or anywhere. Um, the early evidence, um, Gary's right in this, this point, the early evidence suggests uh, movement to online gambling. And that's a concern because that is also addictive. And in on ga online gambling, the proceeds, proceeds often go overseas. However, I am also a very strong advocate of public participation in as many ways as possible. I was a bit surprised when this came back because I had forgotten but then was reminded by staff that yes, we looked at it last year, but we also told staff that we needed some information and we needed to look at it again in another year, which is exactly, so they're just following the process that we as governors put in front of them, that bring it back. Notwithstanding, not all the information we may have liked to have is here, and notwithstanding that some of the information that they've been able to ask for is, is inadequate, is incomplete and uh, incorrect, um, they are following the process this council set. So here we are. And as I say again, I um, want to, the public to have as many opportunities as possible to engage in issues that are of high public interest, and this is that opportunity. I do believe um, other, candidate, uh, other councillors have made some very good points about what might be also considered in the, the consultation form, and I think we should have another look at the final form of that um, consultation. I will acknowledge also, however, that, and having attended the Sport NZ forum, that there is a pending uh, funding gap to be dealt with. I accept what Councillor Hamilton says, that it's not like the tap being completely turned off overnight, that we've got some time to deal with it. But I urge us to actively explore ways that we will deal with this future funding gap because there is a lot of community good that is occurring off the back of um, these proceeds. Sports clubs, um, alt cultural and arts clubs do choose, for whatever reason, to use that funding. That doesn't mean I think they should. I'm just saying that the real in the real world, they are using that funding because they need the money to do their activities. But let's go out to the public. Let's uh, hope that people on both sides of the debate use this opportunity that we're providing them because that's what it's about true public consultation um councillor o'leary you have right of reply thank you madam chair in my right of reply i'll respond to some of the comments made in the chamber uh, Councillor Hamilton's line, something about uh, perpe perpetuate, what? perpetuating poverty um, is a quirky line intent to grab a media headline with what is a very serious issue. Uh, if with that sweeping quirky line statement that he made, he was imply implying that I don't address harm in our city as a governor when I approach policy, uh, I would remind him that it was my policy work that led us to pioneer the closing of all synthetic stores in Hamilton, uh, in New Zealand. So I reject uh, uh, being involved in that sweeping statement. My concern is that we could be missing an opportunity to reduce harm in a meaningful way, and timing is everything. And when I reflect back on that synthetic cannabis policy that I led, Timing was absolutely everything and critical. Um, however, I, if the motion is lost, then I will support the process and 
participate fully as I have always done. Um, I would rather be spending this time thinking about one of the other uh, issues that we're, this council, or future council, will be facing very early on into its term, which is the government is already indicating, the minister is already indicating, that based on the, what the outcome of the referendum on the approach to marijuana use, that could be coming back to local councils in the similar vein that synthetic cannabis came back to us for a local policy and alcohol came back to us for a local policy. So uh, if we think this issue is difficult and addresses, uh, has the conversation around harm, then, then believe you me, that one is going to have uh, massive consequences if we are uh, expected by central government to respond in a local way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Before we go to the vote, I just want to thank you for your forthright questions and debate. I'd just like to encourage members in this committee to, to tackle the issue and not directly tackle uh, individuals. And I don't, don't think that um, uh, anything was implied by Councillor Ryan's uh, comments. However, we're, talking, we're here to talk about the issues, and that's what we must focus on. We'll go to the vote. Pardon? On the amendment. Sorry, yes, you're right. The amendment is carried. Eight for or against? Okay, now, so the am amendment becomes the substantive and we vote again, please. Oh, what happened to you? We'll restart. <laughs> Again? The amendment is carried. Nine for, for against. The amendment becomes a substantive. The amendment as a substantive motion is declared carried. 10 for, 3 against. Thank you, councillors. Um, we deserve a comfort stop and a break. We'll be back in quarter of an hour. Um, we're hoping to stop at 1.